Hi, I'm Dr. Tony Evans, and I'm excited for you to join me on Heroes in the Bible. Please be sure to follow the podcast on Apple or Spotify so you get the newest episodes right as they come out. Welcome to the Epic Adventure of David, a story of honor, battle, jealousy, darkness, friendship, love, scandal, and murder. While most people know of David the myth, few know about David the man. In this episode, David expands the power of Israel with alarming speed. He establishes the small nation of former slaves into the most powerful nation in the region. David serves up justice to the corrupt nations, liberates the oppressed nations, and elevates the poor nations. The giant slayer is world famous, and it is impossible for him to be forgotten. This episode has a few battles that give us some epic fights. David even faces another giant. But there are also some tender and emotional moments in this episode. David the warrior and David the poet interchange seamlessly, and we get to witness compelling acts of love and kindness. We will also get to meet another character in this episode, a boy who has remained hidden from David for fear of his life. However, the two of them will share a bond unlike anything since Jonathan. This boy will bring out some of David's best qualities and remind us that for all of the king's bloody conquests, he is still a tender poet at heart. This episode will be longer than any we've had before, but for good reason. Allow yourself to be immersed in the story. See what David sees and feel what David feels in episode 23, Strength and Love. Prelude to Chapter 23 Wake up! The nursemaid cried out. Wake up, my prince! Wake up! Prince Mephibosheth woke up to his panicked nursemaid shaking him awake. We don't have much time. We need to get you to safety. Mephibosheth, only five years old, did not know what to make of the pandemonium. The nursemaid put on his clothes, grabbed his hand, and escorted him out of his home. They ran out into the second floor overlooking the city. Mephibosheth saw flames in the distance. Red hues engulfed the horizon, and the skies were painted black from the smoke. What is happening? The young child said. Where are we going? The Philistines have overtaken the borders of Israel. Your father and grandfather have fallen, and there is no one to protect us. She yelled. Mephibosheth tugged away at his nursemaid's hand and began to cry. My father is dead. He yelled. Where is my mother? There is no time. We must get you away from here before the Philistines come. No. The young prince cried. No, no. I want my father. Jonathan is dead. The nursemaid shouted. Now come with me if you don't want to die either. She picked up the crying boy and began to run down the stairs leading into the courtyard. Mephibosheth tugged and cried to be released. Out of panic, he threw himself out of her arms and tumbled down the stairs. He cried out in intense pain. The nursemaid ran down to him. She looked down at his legs. Both feet were completely broken. She held him helplessly as the five-year-old boy wailed in pain. I want my father! He cried out. I know! She whispered in his ear, stroking the back of his hair. I know! The son of Jonathan and grandson of Saul whimpered in her arms. Plumes of smoke blocked out the sun, and all hope seemed lost for the little prince. Chapter 23, Strength and Love All feared and respected his name. There was not a king or commander in the east that did not tremble when they heard he was marching up against them. David's name had stretched past the hill country of the Philistines all the way into Moab and Syria. No evil nation was safe as long as David resided on the throne of Jerusalem. Yet even so, they tried to take hold of Israel and make them captive again. Kings tried and failed to take hold of cities on the borders of Israel. They wanted to posture themselves against David and prove their strength. They shouted and clamored. They roared and raved, but the king of Israel would not flinch. In just a few years as king, David had lived up to the name Giant Slayer. First, it was the Philistines. The age-long foe of God's people seized the borderlands of Israel. The families of farmers and herdsmen were either cast out or taken as slaves. The Philistines spited David and his God by oppressing the people. David leaned over the table of meeting. Across from him was Joab. The two of them discussed marching up to defend the borders. 
But David had another idea. No matter how many times we've defended ourselves, they continue to attack us. David said. They take hold of our cities, we drive them out, and then they repeat the process. The king shook his head and sighed. Defense is not working. It is time we show them our true strength. Joab perked up and gave David a curious look. David did not smile. He maintained his intense gaze at the map and pointed to a spot in the heart of Philistine land. Metheg Amma, he said in the Philistines' native language, otherwise known as Gath. David rolled back his shoulders and drove a blade through the map. We will march towards Gath and hit them in the heart. Days later, they marched past the borders of Israel to the Philistine city of Gath. David looked up at the jagged hills leading down to the city. He remembered fleeing to Gath when he was running from Saul. Achish the king had given him a safe haven when he and his men were in need. However, that bond was severed when the Philistines continued to attack them. Up until now, David had shown mercy by not marching against their territory. But too much Hebrew blood had been spilled at the hand of the Philistines. They advanced to the borders of Gath. David stood in front of his men with the sword of Goliath strapped to his back. He took it out and looked at it. He had carried it for so long that it seemed more like his sword now. David remembered it being heavier when he first used it. Yet now the weight seemed comfortable, like an extension of his own arms. He looked down at the city and waved for his men to begin their attack. What followed was an all-out conquest of the city. David did not only defeat the Philistine guards, but he also subdued the capital. The wicked people of Gath would no longer be able to raise up armies to harm the people of Israel. David would have no more slaughter. No more humiliation at the hand of these uncircumcised dogs. They would learn to fear the Lord and think twice before marching against his children. The second nation to feel the scorn of David was Moab. The bond he shared with Moab through his great-grandmother Ruth was severed by years of betrayal. The Moabites were at odds with Israel, seeking to conquer land close to them. David would not allow the Moabites to press up against Israel especially when their king was not a man of his word. They were a rising nation that was growing in both number and wickedness. David knew he had to make a decision regarding the Moabites. Would he shrink back and wait for them to attack? Or would he establish the nation of Israel as a people not to be trifled with? After careful planning, David chose to march. Moab was inundated with the armies of David. They broke down their gates with battering rams and set fire to the temples of their false gods. David entered in with strength, and all trembled at the sight of him. Although David was not a brutal man, he understood the culture of the Moabites. For years, they had brutally slaughtered surrounding nations, putting their heads on pikes and sacrificing children to their gods. A simple defeat would not resonate with them. David needed to send a clear message of strength. After they conquered the army of Moab, David rode in on horseback and had the Moabites set in three lines lying on the ground. He scanned the crowd. You are now under the rule of Israel, he said. We have shown ourselves more than capable of utterly destroying your city. If we chose, we could burn it to the ground. However, we will not, for we believe in a God of mercy. I also know your works and your predisposition to violence. Perhaps this will send a clear message to you. David nodded to his men, and two of the three lines of Moabite soldiers were put to death. Screams and wails echoed throughout the valley, and blood soaked the ground below. Only one line was spared. You may return to your homes and recover what you have lost, David said to the remaining survivors. However, we will expect tributes from you. If you do your diligence to pay, we will spare you and take care of your borders. Perhaps, many years from now, we can live in peace with each other. The next people to challenge David were the Syrians. The Syrians were divided into two kingdoms, Zoba and Damascus. Both had their boots on the throats of surrounding villages, preventing trade from coming in through the Euphrates River. David knew that if he could gain power over the Euphrates River, he could open up trade for Israel and other small nations. 
It would be a great economic success for them and the poor nations of the East. David was reminded of God's promise to Abraham so many years ago when he said, Unto thy seed I have given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. The Euphrates is promised to our people, he said to the elders. If we can take power over it, we can bless the world. God knows we would be good stewards of the river, so I am confident he will give us favor against the Syrians. The elders agreed, so David marched to go take hold of the river. The first kingdom to come against him was Zobah, led by King Hadadezer. Hadadezer was a power-hungry and bloodthirsty king. Bent on maintaining his oppressive grip over the surrounding land, he arrogantly marched up against David, posturing with tens of thousands of men. However, David knew just where to hurt them most. Direct all of your focus on horsemen and chariots, he said to his foot soldiers. Be swift on your feet and aim low at the legs. So off they went. The two armies converged in the middle, determined to gain the upper hand. David led from the front, gliding past the soldiers and taking out the horsemen. The armies of Israel rampaged against the Syrians, successfully taking out 1,700 horsemen, 20,000 foot soldiers, and 100 chariots. David's ferocity in battle was a thing to behold. Many soldiers stood back and watched as the king maneuvered through the battlefield. He was like a poet, his sword the ink and the battlefield his parchment. King Hadadezer was outmatched and called for reinforcements from Damascus. Thousands of soldiers came to the battlefield seeking to overwhelm David. However, they barely came close to winning. 22,000 more Syrians died on the battlefield that day. An overwhelming torrent of might was displayed. Similarly to the Moabites, the Syrians were made subjects of Israel, paying tribute to them for safety and economic stability. The Euphrates was now controlled by Israel, and David opened up trade for the other nations, freeing the chokehold the Syrians had on the region. Toy, the king of Hamath, was grateful for the victory David had over the Syrians. For many years, the Syrians had oppressed and slaughtered the people of Hamath. King Toy sent his son Joram to bring gifts of silver, gold, and bronze to David as a thanks. David received it with humility and offered the entire gift up to the Lord. All the spoils of war were given as an offering to the Lord, either dedicated for the priests or as a gift to the poor. David kept very little wealth for himself. He did not build more palaces or plant more gardens. He knew that the victory he gained was from the Lord, and to the victor go the spoils. The entire continent knew once and for all that David was the king elevated by God, and no one would defeat him. No one from the outside, that is. David sat on the rooftop of his palace, looking down at the city below. Jerusalem, the city of David, a symbol of God's favor on his reign as king. The radiance of the setting sun warmed the evening, painting it in a candescent orange. It was a beautiful sight to behold. Israel was now a strong and noble fortress for God's people. However, peace came at a great price, particularly to David's body. The king leaned back and drew a deep breath. His body ached from months of battle. His recent victories were sweet, but there was a tinge of bitterness in every one of them. Before he was king, he dreamed of fighting and ruling alongside Jonathan, his friend and brother-in-arms. He was a constant source of encouragement and love in his life, and he missed him dearly. His heart ached at the thought of him. David leaned back and recollected the times they shared. He remembered the covenant they both made long ago. He remembered Jonathan's words after he saved him from Saul. All those who seek to destroy you will now be eliminated, and God will pave the way for your kingdom. Please, I beg you, show love to my house when God removes your enemies. Be kind to my wife and children. David watched the sunset, considering all that he wished he could have done with Jonathan. He shook his head in disappointment and said to himself, I will keep my promise to my friend. I will not break my covenant. The next morning, David was sitting at his desk, mulling over new trade agreements made since the conquest of the Euphrates. All was silent as David sifted through the parchment. 
The door knocked, and an old man entered the room. It was Ziba, a servant from the house of Saul. He had served the previous king and his family for years before the death of Jonathan and the other sons. You asked for me, my lord? The old man said pensively. Ziba was the head of Saul's home and oversaw all the care of the family. Since Isposheth's death, he had been out of work along with his 15 children. David smiled. Yes, Ziba, thank you for coming. I have a request. Would you please inquire if there is anyone else from the house of Saul that I can show kindness to? I wish to bless his family, for Jonathan's sake. The servant looked confused. It was uncommon for kings to bless the living relatives of a previous king. More often, they would be searched out and killed. However, David was a king of a different breed. He desired to show mercy to the family of Saul. Is there still anyone in the house of Saul that is living? David asked again. Yes, Ziba said. There is a living son of Jonathan. He is a cripple and still in his youth. David's heart sank. He had not known any of Jonathan's sons were still alive. He thought they all died in the battle with the Philistines. The king held back tears, trying to hold himself together. He felt the pangs of guilt that he had not known or asked sooner. Where is he now? David asked gently. He is in the house of Machir, uh, the son of Amiel. His wife was the boy's nursemaid. Their home is in Lodabar, Ziba said. The old man paused for a moment and gathered his thoughts. M my king, although the boy has royal blood, he does not carry himself as royalty. He is more of a servant in that house than a prince. He hobbles along and tends to the animals. It is a sad sight to see. He is not a threat to your throne. David could not take any more shame. I do not ask with violent intentions. Please bring him to me. He commanded. I need to speak with him and bless him. Ziba bowed his head and departed. The king breathed in deeply and let out more tears of lament. He was grieved that he had not held up his promise to Jonathan. The sun was light and drifting in the middle of the sky. Not a cloud was in sight for miles, and Mephibosheth was feeling the unforgiving heat on his neck. The animals in the barn needed more water, and Mephibosheth was determined to get it to them. Lame in both his feet, he was forced to walk with his knees and hands. He had created an efficient way to get around, using his hands and arms to act as crutches as he walked with his knees. Even the most trivial of tasks were a challenge to him but he refused to let it define him. He would crawl to and from the well, pushing the cart holding pails of water. It was a task that would have taken anyone else less than 10 minutes, but it was a laborious chore for him. He wanted to be useful to Makir. Since the death of his father, Makir and his family had embraced him as their own. However, he would never quite be one of them. Not only was Mephibosheth the son of a prince, but he was also lame. They were always wanting to coddle him and let him rest in the shade while they worked. But Mephibosheth refused. He conceded that he would never be a warrior like his father, but he would at least be useful. After his eighth trip to the well, Mephibosheth was interrupted. Makir came out of the house and waved him down, saying, Mephibosheth, my boy, come in. You have an old friend here to see you. No one ever came to visit Mephibosheth. In fact, most people didn't know he existed. He preferred it that way, since he was the last remaining heir to Saul's throne. He did not want King David or his subjects learning about him. Perhaps David would want to kill the remaining descendants of Saul to secure his place on the throne. Mephibosheth came in to see Ziba standing inside. Ziba? He exclaimed. Is that you? Ziba smiled and nodded. It is, my prince. It is. It has been far too long. Mephibosheth rushed to Ziba's side and embraced him. I have come to take you to Jerusalem. The king desires to speak with you. Mephibosheth's countenance dampened. He looked up at Makir in questioning. Have I been given up so he can slay me? He asked. Ziba and Makir shrugged. He says his intentions are good, but there is no way to be sure. Ziba said. Your grandfather seemed to be very wary of David. 
He did not trust him and drove him out of the country because of it. However, your father and he were very close, Makir said. Perhaps kindness awaits you in the city of David. Mephibosheth was not so sure. He had heard stories of David as a child. However, his grandfather Saul seemed to be vehemently opposed to him and spent a great deal of resources to kill him. Mephibosheth was conflicted and scared. Yet there was no more hiding now. He would venture to the king's house in Jerusalem with Ziba and face David. Ziba and Mephibosheth rode into Jerusalem on a small carriage pulled by two colts. The two of them traveled the road leading into Jerusalem in silence, not quite sure how to feel about what would happen next. Mephibosheth sat uncomfortably in place, feeling more vulnerable than usual. His hands began to shake in nervousness. Ziba looked over and placed a hand on his shoulder. He had no encouraging words, just a friendly and fatherly grin of reassurance. The walls of Jerusalem were larger than anything Mephibosheth had seen before. He recalled how big the palace walls in Gibeah were when he lived with his father and grandfather, but they were not nearly as massive as these. The carriage entered through the gates into the heart of the city where David's home resided. Mephibosheth drew a deep breath and exited the cart. He followed Ziba a few paces behind, using his hands and knees to hobble forward. He could feel the confused stares of palace servants on him. He hated being in public. He felt like a freak. Even more embarrassing, he was the only one among them who knew he was a prince. The large wooden doors opened to reveal a large hall leading to the king's courtroom. Torches were mounted on the walls, illuminating the intricately woven tapestries. Mephibosheth stared at them in awe. They told stories of David's mighty battles and military exploits. The young man was enthralled with the details recounting the battle. He saw one of King David as a boy slaying Goliath with his sling. He saw another with David surrounded by a hundred Philistines. Then his eyes were led to another tapestry, one with David back to back with another man, fighting an army of Amalekites. Mephibosheth hobbled closer to see the figure's face in the firelight. It was unmistakably his father, Jonathan. Mephibosheth could not help but smile. He felt a single tear stream down his cheek. He did not always think about his father. His death was a painful memory he desired to forget. As he was taking in the tapestry, a voice called from behind him. Mephibosheth, he asked. The crippled prince turned around to see King David standing behind him a few paces back. Mephibosheth wiped away tears and immediately fell on his face in homage. The boy trembled in fear and laid prostrate on the floor. Please, sir, I am your servant. Do not kill me. David was dismayed and shook his head emphatically. Kill you? Oh no, my son. Do not be afraid. David knelt down and helped the boy back up onto his knees. Mephibosheth took notice of how David remained at eye level with him. No one ever knelt down to speak to him. They remained upright and above him. It had been a long time since anyone looked him in the eye this way. David's warm smile melted away any fear Mephibosheth had. With a gentle voice, he said, I am glad you have come. Had I known you were alive, I would have sent for you sooner. I am sorry. Why would you, the king, apologize to me? I am a cripple and the descendant of your enemy, Saul. That is not true, David exclaimed. I loved your grandfather dearly. He was the Lord's anointed king, and I was loyal to him till the very end. However... It was your father I truly loved. I made a promise to him long ago that I would look after his children. You loved my father? Mephibosheth asked. He died when I was very young. I know very little of him. David gave a large and beaming smile. He wrapped his arms around Mephibosheth and laughed. Oh yes, my dear child. I loved your father more than anyone else in this world. Closer than a brother he was to me. David gestured for Mephibosheth to walk with him. So David kept a slow pace while the boy crawled beside him. He led him into the middle of the hall, where a feast was laid out before them. The two of them sat and spoke for a long while. Ziba was close by, keeping a distance so the two of them might talk in private. David told stories of Jonathan's bravery in battle and his tenderness towards him. He talked about their unbreakable bond and the promises they made to one another. 
I vowed that I would take care of you, Mephibosheth. I intend on keeping that vow, David said. Consider yourself like a son in this household. You will always eat at my table and dine with me as a member of the family. As I was brought in by your grandfather and your father, so I will bring you in. Mephibosheth was overwhelmed by the gesture, but David was not done with his generosity. Ziba, David called out. The servant stepped forward and bowed his head. David smiled at the two of them and said, Mephibosheth, I hereby restore all the land that belonged to Saul and give it to you. You will inherit the land of your grandfather. Mephibosheth was taken back. He shook his head and hid his face. Tears broke through. He was ashamed by the generosity and overwhelmed with the grace David had shown. No! He yelled. I am sorry, my king, but I am not worthy. Mephibosheth said. Who am I that you are mindful of me? I am nothing. You show regard for a dead dog. I am a whimpering child and a cripple. You should not bless me so. David leaned over the table and placed his hand on the boy's shoulder. There was a gentleness in his eyes he did not expect from a king. Come with me, he whispered. David took Mephibosheth to the roof of his home. Both of them gazed at the stars. The galaxies above shone with unfathomable brilliance. Mephibosheth was filled with wonder. He spent much of his days looking up, but never quite like this. The boy turned his gaze to David. His eyes were fixed on the stars. He looked at them like one would to a lifelong love. It took Mephibosheth a moment to realize he was gazing into the face of heaven, considering his God. David smiled and began to recite a hymn he had written long ago. His voice was smooth and gentle, but it traveled like the wind. Mephibosheth listened to him sing. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Above the heavens you have established your glory. Out of the mouth of simple infants you have shown strength. When I look to your heavens, the work of your hands, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him and humanity that you care for us? Yet you have us a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned us with glory and honor. You have given us dominion over your handiwork. You have put all things under our feet, all beasts of the field, the air, the water, and the forest have been given to us as stewards. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The king looked down at the star-struck boy beside him. He knelt down and looked him in the eye. We all may be dogs and whimpering children, Mephibosheth, but God sees it fit to be kind to us. What we deserve is another thing entirely. David stood to his feet and called up Ziba. The old servant scaled the ladder leading up to the rooftop and bowed his head to the king. David placed a hand on Mephibosheth's shoulder and said, I have given the boy his grandfather's land. All that belonged to Saul and his house has been given to him. I appoint you and your sons to work the land and property on his behalf. You and your family will have a place to call home once again, and you shall take care of this young prince. David turned back to Mephibosheth and said, But you will always have a place at my table. 
For the first time in years, the son of Jonathan felt tall again. He leapt to David's waist and hugged him. The king returned the embrace. Miles away from Jerusalem, to the east, the king of Ammon lay on his deathbed. In the heat of the day, the old king rested his head, ready to embrace the unknown. King Nahash had been defeated by David a few years prior, but had since come to embrace the role of subject. He was loyal to David and Israel, paying tribute monthly and opening up trade to Israel's allies. His son, Hanun, however, was not as loyal. Hanun saw the presence of Israel as a mark of shame on their nation. He hated Israel and resented David for his success over them. When David heard of Nahash's death, he was cut to the heart and grieved. As a sign of goodwill to his heir and the new king of Ammon, David sent his servants with gifts of goodwill. Nahash and I had good faith with one another. David told his servants, I desire the same between Hanun and I. Go, bring gifts and tell him that I am at his service. If he is in need of extra resources, counsel, or military aid, I shall send it. So the servants ventured off to Ammon. The area had been sapped of much of its resources for quite some time. As the servants of David entered in, they could not help but feel uneasy. There was a darkness to the city, perhaps because the new king had darkness in his heart. The servants walked into the palace of Hanun with trepidation, noticing the glaring looks from palace guards and servants. The halls of the Ammonite king were bare. There were not torches, tapestries, or symbols of prior conquests, just cold and dark stone. At the center of the hall was King Hanun. He sat up anxiously on his throne with four of his advisors sitting on either side of him. Hanun tapped on the side of his throne and frowned. The advisors whispered in his ear next to him, saying, Do you really think David means us no harm, our king? They whispered. If he really honored you and your father, he would have never conquered us. Surely, these men are only here as spies. They want to overthrow us. Do not be ignorant and accept their gifts. The indecipherable hissing of the advisors made the men uneasy. They looked at each other and questioned whether they should leave swiftly. However, before the men had a chance to leave, Hanun spoke, saying, You think I am a fool? He leaned over his throne and spat in their direction. I know you are only here to spy on me. You desire to humiliate me and my people in our weakened state. Well, I will not have it. Hanun stood to his feet ah! and flipped over the table of wine in front of him. His high-pitched and whiny voice was unpleasant to the ear. The messengers recoiled at his outburst. As they turned around, the king clapped his hands together, signaling the palace guards to seize them. Not so fast, little dogs of David. Your nation has humiliated us for too long. It is time to return the favor. The guards kicked them in the knees, forcing them to the ground. The king stepped down with his dagger and pointed it at them. He sneered and said, Shave off half their beards. The men's eyes widened with fear as the guards pinned them down and took daggers to their faces. A man's beard was a sign of their freedom. It is what differentiated them from common slaves. To shave off half their beard would be a disgrace. The men struggled, but ultimately failed to defend themselves. Half their beards were shaved off, and they were beaten until red in the face. Then King Hanun took his own dagger and cut off the lower half of their garments, exposing their genitals before everyone. He laughed and pointed. To make it even worse, he paraded them in front of the palace for all to see. After humiliating them, he forced them out to flee back home. Tell your king that I will no longer be paying tribute! He spat as he spoke, raving at them as they ran away. Tell your dog of a king! that I shall amass an army so large that he will be bowing before me and begging for mercy. I shall do to him what I have done to you. Tell David I will be waiting. The men were in tears, running for their lives back to Israel. However, they would not go back home to Jerusalem. They remained hidden in Jericho, too embarrassed to be seen by anyone. The four servants of David remained in a small cottage outside the city of Jericho. They had retrieved new garments to cover themselves, but were still too ashamed to enter into the public. They did not want to be seen with half of their beards, so they remained hidden and embarrassed. 
It was late, and the sun had just retreated behind the hills when the cottage door knocked. It creaked open, and a hooded figure entered the room. The men unsheathed their swords, but then stopped when they saw it was their king. David removed his hood and smiled. Hello, my brothers, he said gently. The men were overwhelmed with emotion. They fell to their king's feet and thanked him for coming. We are sorry, David. We failed you. They cried. You did nothing of the sort, David said. His face was filled with understanding and sympathy. He touched their faces and shook his head. I am sorry they did this to you. King Hanun said that he is a Massian army to come up against you, they said. He told us that he would do the same to you. David clenched his jaw. Did he now? The king's demeanor shifted, and he stood up straight. He looked down at his servants and said, Stay here until your beards grow back. Rest assured that you have done nothing wrong. I will avenge this shame he has put upon you. With those words, David departed. Joab was waiting for him outside. I will not endure with the Ammonites any longer. Take them out. Joab grinned and bowed his head. He and Abishai gathered the army of Israel and marched east to avenge their brothers. David had endured many insults in his lifetime. He had been forgotten by his father, mocked by giants and hunted by kings. However, no one would lay a hand on his sheep and live to tell the tale. King Hanun was about to feel the fury of the shepherd of Israel. The two brothers sat on top of a hill, overlooking the encampment of the Ammonites. Joab and Abishai peered down, counting the vast sea of enemy soldiers. King Hanun wasn't joking, Abishai said. He has hired the Syrians as mercenaries. He was also able to hire the small kingdoms of Makkah and Tob, Joab said. At least 30,000 extra men at his disposal, not to mention the 400,000 horsemen and 700 chariots Ammon already has. We must expect all of them to march against us tomorrow. Seems excessive for such a small amount of Israelite dogs. Abishai jested. Joab smirked and gestured to the encampment. You see how their men are split into two different camps? Abishai looked down. The enemy encampment was resting in a valley outside the city of Ammon. The Syrians were on the northern side near the battlefield, and the Ammonites were on the southern side near the city gates. Joab pointed to the trails, leading to the battlefield on each side. You see what they're doing? They're planning on attacking us from the front of the battlefield and the rear. Abishai looked closely and saw that his brother was right. They virtually doubled them in size. They had plenty of men to split into two armies and attack from both sides. Abishai stroked his beard and thought for a moment. Then he smiled. Are you thinking what I'm thinking, brother? He asked. Joab returned his smile and nodded. I will take the front. You will take the rear. He said. Tomorrow, I will take our mightiest warriors, Shammah, Eleazar, Uriah, Joshobim, and the other mighty men, and face the Syrians head on. You will stay back and meet the Ammonites when they try to ambush us in the rear. That is under 600 men against 30,000, Joab. Abishai warned. Are you sure that you won't be overwhelmed? Give me 600 of David's trained mighty men against 30,000 of any army. Joab responded with pride. However, if the Syrians prove to be too strong for me, then I shall call out with the ram's horn. If the Ammonites overwhelm you, then you call out and we will come to your aid. Abishai nodded in the affirmative. Be of good courage, little brother. Let us all be courageous for our men and for the nation of God. May God do what seems good in his sight. The next morning, Joab and Abishai prepared their men for battle. The sun had not yet risen, but the warm summer wind from the east was already howling. It was an ugly day for a battle. Joab and his men marched north towards the valley. He and 600 of David's finest marched in perfect cadence with each other. They were disciplined and seasoned warriors forged in the fires of exile. Joab had no doubt that they could easily subdue the Syrian mercenaries. They were hired hands. They had no passion to protect the Ammonite city. He looked forward to breaking their will. Joab could spot the Syrians in the distance. Forward! Joab commanded, and the men were off in a run. Israel's bravest galloped towards their enemy with ferocious speed. They cried out with bloodthirsty roars, sending chills down the Syrian spines. The armies drew closer, 
and Joab called out for the men to attack in formation. They had planned for this. They were ready. Spears and shields! Joab yelled. The men brought their shields in front of their bodies and drew out their spears and attacked in a triangular formation with Joab at the tip. Hundreds of Syrians began to fall as the mighty men drove forward through the fray. Drop spears! Swords out! Joab yelled. The men immediately drove their spears into the nearest soldier and drew out their swords. Then they formed a circle with the enemy on every side. Attack! Joab commanded. The men began an all-out slaughter of the Syrians. The mighty men of Israel bathed their feet in the blood of their enemies. It did not take long for the Syrian commanders to call for a retreat. Not one of Joab's men was lost, a testament to the training of King David. Around the other end of the valley near the city gates, King Hanun sat atop his horse with tens of thousands of soldiers behind him. I want more than victory! He yelled to his men. I want you to humiliate them! Drag them by their beards and scorn their mothers! Take their dignity, then take their lives! So King Hanun marched with his men to take out Joab and the others. However, before they could gain momentum, Abishai attacked from the rear. He and the army of Israel leapt into battle, quickly gaining the upper hand on the Ammonites. King Hanun and his men stubbornly persisted against the army of Israel. They fought thinking they had the security of the Syrians. However, when Hanun saw that the Syrians were fleeing, he knew all hope was lost. Retreat! Hanun called out. Run back into the city! We will live to fight another day! So the Ammonites fled, and the armies of Israel cheered in victory. Joab and Abishai returned home to Jerusalem and brought reports back to their king. They were sure to mention the fear in Hanun's eyes when he saw the Syrians flee. David was pleased with his men and reassured of God's favor over the nation of Israel. They are dogs! Every last one of them! Hadadezer yelled. The king of Syria raved and ranted from the latest defeat. He pointed to King Hanun in anger. You sent us into a bloodbath! The king of Ammon sneered at the king of Syria and replied. I hired you, and your men tucked their tails and ran like children. They are so weak that 30,000 of them could not even beat 600. You dare call us weak after your pathetic showing? Hadadezer was fuming with anger. You started this, Hanun, but we will finish it. The king of Syria brought in his commander, Shobak. He was a giant of a man with legs the size of tree trunks and arms as solid as stone. He wore a heavy coat of mail and thick leather boots. The entire nation of Syria feared and revered him. Commander Shobak, I want you to send 700 chariots and 40,000 horsemen past the Euphrates. March against King David and remind him that he leads a nation of former slaves. Shobak bowed his head and left. King Hanun also departed to amass more men. He would attack Israel again. The warrior king looked down at the Jordan River. The waters were calm enough to cross, but still too deep to tread lightly. He stepped in. The cool water was refreshing compared to the hot sun beating down above him. As he led his men through the water, he could not help but think of his ancestors crossing Jordan so long ago, how God had provided a way for the Ark of the Covenant to cross. Yet the waters would not part for him. He waded through, watching the light bounce off the vibrant turquoise waters. Once they were across, it was not long before reaching Halam. There, the Syrian army was awaiting him. David, Shammah, Eleazar, and Abishai stood at the front, mounted on horses. The Syrian army was colossal compared to what they had faced in the past. They dwarfed Israel in size and horses. However, what Israel lacked in size, they made up for in the favor of God. David knew the victory was won already. He only needed to step into it bravely. The king looked at the sea of Syrians arrayed before them. He turned back to his men and rose his sword high in the air. Take heart, my brothers, for we fight for the nation of God. As David often did, he ran into battle without a care as to who was behind him. He galloped on horseback fiercely towards the enemy. He howled with a fierce cry from his belly and pressed onward. The men of Israel ran behind him, 
inspired by the bravery of their king. The 40,000 horsemen charged at David. Compared to this, his battle against Goliath seemed like nothing. Like a tempest, the Syrians raged against the king of Israel. However, they were outmatched. David vaulted into the battle, raging through the enemy like a wildfire and dry brush. His anger was palpable, spilling over onto the Syrians like a volcanic eruption. His men were fighting behind him, advancing more and more into the center of the fray. David continued to slice through the enemy until he was knocked off his horse at the heart. He fell onto his back and the wind immediately left his lungs. As he tried to recover, a large boot kicked him in the side, sending him flying in the air. David landed in the dust and looked up. He was Shobach, the giant commander. Shobach thrust his sword downward at David, but he quickly pulled to the side and dodged it. David rose to his feet and picked up his sword. He and the commander of Syria circled one another, waiting for the right moment to strike. Shobak moved first, swinging his broad sword at his neck. David blocked the attack with his sword, but was knocked off balance. Shobak was stronger than David. Each blow with his sword was carried with the strength of ten men. David continued to parry each attack, barely getting any chance to retaliate. David looked closely for an opening as he dodged and parried each blow, but time was running out. He did not know how many more blows his bones could handle. He could feel his arms shaking and his wrists growing tired. David had to act quickly, but there seemed to be no way of killing him. Every inch of his body was covered in mail, and his feet were protected by heavy boots. Yet there was one area that was uncovered. The space between his armor and his helmet it was ironic that David had not thought of this first. He took out his sling, placed a stone in it, and drew it back. Shobak advanced with his sword ready to kill, and David released his sling into the air. The stone hit Shobak on the cheek, cracking it and drawing blood. He stumbled back and held his face. While he was reeling in pain, David pounced and drove his sword through his armor and into his stomach. Shobak fell onto his knees and fell to the ground with his face in the dirt. David cried out into the skies, and the flurry of soldiers around him quickly took over the battle. Israel came upon the Syrians with unstoppable force, and David once again proved his dominance over them. They were subdued, and Israel was victorious once again. All the kings of Syria and the surrounding nations saw that there was no stopping the people of Israel. They made peace with David and became subjects to him. Although the Ammonites continued to fight, the Syrians would no longer come to their aid. David's dominance in the land became renowned. His fearlessness in battle earned him the respect of every king and warrior in the land. He conquered cities, expanded his kingdom, and brought security to the once tormented and vulnerable nation of Israel. From the outside looking in, there seemed to be nothing that could vanquish King David. No foe was too large or mighty to bring him down, and no army was vast enough to come against him. However, David would soon face an enemy greater than Goliath or Shobach. He would wrestle with a foe too formidable for even the giant slayer to vanquish. The chosen hero of God would soon be brought to his knees in defeat. Love and Justice David held mercy, tenderness, and compassion in one hand while holding judgment, violence, and ferocity in another. This episode gave us a perspective of David through two different lenses. The first perspective was through the lens of surrounding nations. To them, the giant slayer was decisive in his speech, heavy with his sword, and pragmatic with his strategy. He dealt harshly with the corrupt and historically oppressive nations. The second perspective was through the lens of Mephibosheth. To him, David was compassionate, giving of himself, and deeply poetic. He dealt graciously with the crippled son of Jonathan, and he proved that his heart harbored no bitterness towards Saul. This episode further communicated to us David's dual nature. He was fierce but fair. He had strength and he had love. I personally love that David could not be reduced to just one thing. He had depth, nuance, and range. In this episode, we get Peak David. This is the king we knew he would become. But even in the beginning of the episode, we get some hints that something may be awry. 
If you go back and listen, you will hear little warnings of things to come. At the end of the next episode, we will discuss a few of those clues. I can't wait for you to notice them. The most compelling storyline in this episode was Mephibosheth. The prelude was heart-wrenching as we listened to the poor whimperings of a child who wants his mom and dad. Any parent's heart aches at the thought of their child being hurt and afraid without them. It takes David a while to find out Mephibosheth is even alive. When he does, he lavishes upon him praise and favor. There was a tender moment between the two of them when Mephibosheth rejects David's favor and says, I am sorry, my king, but I am not worthy. Who am I that you are mindful of me? I am nothing. You show regard for a dead dog. I am a whimpering child and a cripple. You should not bless me in this way. I am not my father. He was a mighty warrior. I am a cripple. Mephibosheth was convinced he was not worthy of David's love. David took Mephibosheth outside and showed him the stars. Then he recited Psalm 8. O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Above the heavens you have established your glory. Out of the mouth of simple infants you have shown strength. When I look at your heavens, the work of your hands, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? and humanity that you care for us. Yet you have made us only a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned us with glory and honor. You have given us dominion over your handiwork. You have put all things under our feet. All beasts of the field, the air, the water, and the forest have been given to us as stewards. O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. It was like David was throwing Mephibosheth's words right back at him. He reminded all of us that none of us are truly worthy of God's love, but he gives it anyway. Worthy has nothing to do with it. God loves us because he is loving, not because we deserve love. What we do with that love is up to us, and what Mephibosheth does with David's blessing is up to him. After the beautiful interaction with David and Mephibosheth, we are thrust into a different storyline. The king of Ammon died, and David sent his men with gifts to offer his condolences. They returned his kindness with evil and humiliated his servants. You and I may have thought the same thing when we heard this story. What on earth were they thinking? Everyone should know by now that David is not a man to be trifled with. Even more, he is not a man to allow his people to be humiliated. David connected with his servants and embraced them with understanding. Then he made preparations to march against the Ammonites. In C.S. Lewis's timeless classic, The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the beavers who are explaining to the children who Aslam the lion is, Aslam is the king of Narnia and represents Jesus. Aslam is a lion, the lion, the great lion, said the beaver. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. This description of Adlam is a wonderful description of King David. He's good, but he is most definitely not safe. The king of Israel is compassionate, kind, and good, but he is also passionate, fierce, and dangerous. David marched against Ammon and vanquished them. Then he marched against the Syrians who allied with them and vanquished them as well. In two of David's battles, our attention is brought back to the sword of Goliath and the sling. Remember, these are icons for us to remember who David is at his core. When we notice the sword, the sling, or Jonathan's armor, it gives us a pleasant reminder of the shepherd boy who ran after the lion and the small runt who faced the giant. It is good to tether our hearts to these things and remember where they came from lest we get lost. The episode ends with yet another victory, but we are also given a teaser for the next episode. From the outside looking in, there seemed to be nothing that could vanquish King David. No foe was too large or mighty to bring him down, and no army was vast enough to come against him. However, David would soon face an enemy even greater than Goliath or Shobak. He would wrestle with a foe too formidable for even the giant slayers to vanquish. The chosen hero of God would soon be brought to his knees in defeat. Who is this foe David is going to face? Who could ever stand a chance against the giant slayer? 
We have just spent 23 episodes witnessing the gargantuan rise of King David. But you know what they say, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. It's now time to learn about David's greatest defeat, a failure he may never recover from. Join us for episode 24, Lust and Murder. Thanks again for listening. For more inspiring stories, daily prayers, and wisdom to last a lifetime, go to Pray.com. And to expand your Heroes in the Bible journey, download the Heroes of the Faith devotional at TonyEvans.org forward slash heroes. Follow the podcast on Apple or Spotify to get the newest episodes right as they come out and always be inspired by the Bible. God bless. Hello, my name is Matthew Potter, co-founder of Pray.com. I wanted to ask, do you know what your bank does with your money? At America's Christian Credit Union, your everyday banking helps grow churches, expand the reach of missions agencies, and supports fellow believers across the country. Learn more about specials for switching to ACCU and their nationwide banking capabilities at americaschristiancu.com forward slash pray. Plus, the peace of mind knowing that this credit union is federally insured by the National Credit Union Administration.